Thank you, operator. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us on today's earnings conference call and webcast to discuss SGH's third quarter fiscal 2022 results and the company's entry into a definitive agreement to acquire Stratus Technologies. Joining me today are Mark Adams, Chief Executive Officer, Jack Pacheco, Chief Operating Officer, and Ken Rigby, Chief Financial Officer. You can find the accompanying slide presentations and press releases for this call on the Investor Relations section of our website. We encourage you to go to the site throughout the quarter for the most current information on the company, including information on the various financial conferences we will attend. I would also like to remind everyone to read the use of forward-looking statements note that we have included in the earnings press release and the earnings call presentation. Please note that certain of the statements made today may constitute forward-looking statements and that these statements are our present expectations and that actual events or results may differ materially. We will also discuss both GAAP and non-GAAP financial measures. Non-GAAP measures should not be considered in isolation from, as a substitute for, or superior to our GAAP results. We encourage you to consider all measures when analyzing our performance. A reconciliation of the GAAP to non-GAAP measures is included in today's press release. With that, let me turn the call over to Mark Adams, CEO. Mark? Thank you, Suzanne. And thank you to all who have joined us today. We are excited to share our third quarter results and to discuss SGH's planned acquisition of Stratus Technologies. I will start today's call with a review of our operating results for the third quarter. Ken will cover our Q3 financials and our guidance for next quarter. We will then provide an overview of the planned acquisition of Stratus before opening the call for Q&A. Q3 was another strong quarter as we delivered our ninth consecutive quarter of year-over-year top-line growth with revenue of $463 million above the midpoint of our guidance range. In addition, non-GAAP gross margins were at the high end of our guidance range at 25.7%, and non-GAAP EPS came in above the high end of the guidance range at $0.87 cents per share. Stepping back from our quarterly performance, I want to highlight what we have accomplished in the early stages of our transformation at SGH. In less than two years, we have grown top-line revenue from $1.1 billion to over $1.8 billion over the last four quarters expanded our gross margins from 19.8% to over 25%, diversified our revenue with the organic growth of IPS and with the acquisition of Cree LED, strengthened our balance sheet, leveraging our strong cash flow generation, and continued to invest in our long-term success, as demonstrated by our announcement today of the planned acquisition of Stratus Technologies. More on that in a bit. Now let me turn to a brief review of each of our businesses. Starting with IPS, revenue came in at $95 million for the third quarter, up 16% sequentially, and approximately flat for the third quarter of 2021. In addition, we expanded service revenue in the third quarter to $34 million, up 105% compared with Q3 of the prior fiscal year. Services revenue represented approximately 36% of IPS revenue in Q3 of 2022, a record for services as a percent of total revenue for IPS. Heading into our fourth quarter, we are seeing strong sequential demand for IPS driven primarily by growth in sales to our commercial customer base. Based on our backlog, our Q4 top line is anticipated to grow north of 30% sequentially quarter over quarter. While we benefited from a strong mix of services in Q3, our growth in Q4 is driven by new project rollouts that are more hardware intensive. Looking out into the first half of fiscal 2023, 
We are seeing strong demand continue as we ramp new customers and expand projects at our existing customers. While we are not providing guidance, ITS's current backlog is approximately half of a billion dollars in all-time high. Now turning to our LED solutions group. Cree LED had another strong quarter of operating performance. Revenue was $101 million in Q3, helped by strong performance in the Americas and EMEA, which partially offset demand softness in the greater China, Southeast Asia region, which continues to be hampered by COVID-related policies affecting supply chain networks. Pre-LED continues its focus on innovation by delivering differentiated solutions with a strong technology and value proposition to its customers. Just last week at Light Fair 2022, Cree-LED's XE slash GLED family of products were recognized by the Edison Report as a top 10 must-see product delivering significant performance advantage in color mixing applications. We remain confident in the long-term operating performance of the LED business. In our memory solutions group, operating under the Smart Modular brand name, revenue came in at $266 million, a year-over-year -year growth of 11%. Demand for our core specialty memory offerings, such as DDR3, DDR4, and flash memory products from customers in the enterprise computing, networking, telecom, and storage segments was key to our strong performance. In Brazil, we experienced softness driven by a decline in consumer demand for smartphones and PCs, and we anticipate this will persist into the fourth quarter. We remain disciplined in managing our operating expense and capital expenditures as we continue to focus on generating cash from our Brazil operations. Our consolidated results for the third quarter demonstrate the benefits of our growth and diversification strategy. We believe we are in the right markets, benefiting from long-term secular growth drivers such as AI, machine learning, data analytics, cloud, and high-performance computing. I want to recognize our nearly 4,000 employees worldwide for a strong third quarter. We are in the beginning stages of a major transformation and I couldn't be more excited about the future of STH. And now I'll hand it over to Ken for a more detailed review of our Q3 financial performance and our guidance for next quarter. We will then provide an overview of our announced acquisition of Stratus before opening the lines for Q&A. Ken? Thanks, Mark. I will focus my remarks on our non-GAAP results, which are reconciled to GAAP in our earnings release table. The third quarter of 2022 is the ninth consecutive quarter of year-over-year -year growth for SGH, demonstrating how our strategy continues to yield positive results and benefits from our diversified revenue stream. We see tremendous opportunities ahead for SGH to deliver advanced technology solutions for our customers across all three of our businesses. Now let me turn to our detailed results for the third quarter of fiscal 2022. We reported another strong quarter. Net sales were $463 million, a 6% increase year over year from the third quarter of fiscal 2021. In addition, non-GAAP growth margin came in at 25.7% at the high end of our guidance range. And non-GAAP deleted earnings per share was 87 cents for the third quarter above the high end of our guidance range. Our gross margin and earnings per share were higher in the third quarter, in part due to the timing of higher margin service revenue for ITS, which was originally expected in the fourth quarter. For the third quarter, ITS had revenue of $95 billion, up approximately 16% sequentially, driven by growth in commercial and federal sales. In addition, we had record services revenue in ITS in the third quarter, which helped the overall margin profile for SGH. We continue to see strong demand for ITS into the fourth quarter of 2022, and demand trends remain strong as we look into the first half of 2023, as Mark highlighted earlier. 
we expect fourth quarter IPS revenue to have a greater mix of hardware. Our LED solutions group had revenues of $101 million in the third quarter, which was relatively flat with the same quarter a year ago. Sales were impacted from lower demand in the greater China and Southeast Asia region, which represented over 35% of LED sales this quarter. Our memory solutions group had revenues of $256 million in the third quarter, which was 11% higher than the third quarter of the previous fiscal year, driven by growth in our specialty memory business. Non-GAAP growth margin for SGH in the third quarter of 2022 was 25.7%, up from 21.9% in the year-ago quarter. Non-GAAP operating expenses for the third quarter were $64.6 million, up from approximately $52 million in the third quarter of 2021. Operating expenses were up primarily due to the continued investments across all three of our businesses, as well as a reduction from financial credit in Brazil. Operating expenses benefited in the third quarter of 2022 from 3.3 million in financial credits in Brazil, which was down from $6 million in the second quarter. This credit is expected to provide approximately $2 million of benefit in our fourth quarter of 2022. Non-GAAP diluted earnings per share for the third quarter of 2022 was $0.87 per share, up 24% from $0.70 per share in the year-ago quarter. Adjusted EBITDA for the third quarter of 2022 was $64 million, or 14% of sales, compared to $51 million, or 12% of sales in the year-ago quarter. Now turning to working capital, our net accounts receivable totaled $357 million, compared with $386 million last quarter. And day sales outstanding came in at 31 days, down 13 days from the last quarter. Inventory totaled $365 million at the end of the third quarter, up from $334 million at the end of the prior quarter. This growth was driven primarily by higher inventory for IPS as we prepare for bills in the fourth quarter and into the first half of fiscal 2023. Inventory turns were 10.1 times in the third quarter versus 8.1 times in the prior quarter. And consistent with past practice, accounts receivable, days outstanding, and inventory turnover are calculated on a gross sales and cost of goods sold basis which were $1.037 billion and $922 million, respectively, for the third quarter. As a reminder, the difference between gross revenue and net sales is related to our logistics business, which is accounted for on an agent basis, meaning that we only recognize the net profit on the logistics services as net sales. Cash and equivalents totaled a record $387 million at the end of the third quarter, compared with $366 million at the end of the prior quarter. Third quarter cash flow from operations totaled $36.7 million, compared with $32.2 million in the prior quarter. With the continued global electronic supply chain constraints, as well as the inventory required to support IPS demand, more of our capital has been tied up in working capital over the past year. For those of you tracking CapEx and depreciation, CapEx was $9.2 million in the third quarter, and depreciation was $10.6 million. In the third quarter, we repurchased 448,000 shares, spending approximately $10.2 million during the quarter under our $75 million share repurchase authorization and we continue to repurchase shares into the fourth quarter. As a reminder, our capital allocation strategy is as follows. First and foremost, we will continue to invest in our businesses as we see significant opportunities for further organic growth in each of our three business segments. Second, we will continue to review 
and seek acquisition opportunities such as Stratus for further scale and diversification in a disciplined manner. And finally, the share repurchases provide us flexibility to return capital to our shareholders in an opportunistic and price-sensitive manner. With the opportunity ahead of us to acquire Stratus Technologies, we have suspended our share repurchase authorization effective today to align our capital resources towards the strategic acquisition. Now, let me turn to our fourth quarter guidance. We expect that our net sales for the fourth quarter of 2022 will range from approximately $420 million to $460 million, or approximately $440 million at the midpoint. Our guidance incorporates the strong demand in our ITS business, but an offset primarily by slower demand in memory. Our gap gross margin for the fourth quarter is expected to be between 22.5 and 24.5%. Non-GAAP gross margin for the fourth quarter is expected to be approximately 23.5 to 25.5%, in part due to the greater mix of hardware in our IPS business in the fourth quarter, as mentioned earlier. Our non-GAAP operating expenses for the fourth quarter are expected to be approximately $62 million to $66 million. GAAP diluted earnings per share for the fourth quarter is expected to be approximately 22 cents, plus or minus 10 cents. On a non-GAAP basis, excluding share-based compensation expense, intangible amortization expense, debt discount, and other adjustments, we expect non-GAAP diluted earnings per share will be approximately 65 cents, plus or minus 10 cents. Cash capital expenditures for the fourth quarter are expected to be in the range of $9 to $12 million and approximately $38 to $41 million for fiscal 2022. Our gas diluted share count for the fourth quarter is expected to be approximately 55 million shares based on our current stock price. And our non gas diluted share count is expected to be approximately 53 million shares as it includes the benefit of our convertible note cap call. Our forecast for the fourth quarter of fiscal 22 is based on the current environment, which contemplates the global economic environment and ongoing supply chain constraints. Please refer to our non-GAAP financial information section and the reconciliation of GAAP to non-GAAP measured tables in our earnings release for the further details. Now let's turn to the exciting news regarding the announced acquisition of Stratus. Thanks, Ken. Now I'd like to discuss today's announcement that we have entered into a definitive agreement to acquire Stratus Technologies, a global leader in simplified, protected, and autonomous computing solutions in the data center and at the edge. Today's presentation is on our IR website. For those following the presentation, please turn to slide three. We believe that the acquisition of Stratus will be a significant milestone in SGH's transformation into a growth-oriented, diversified company. The business, its products, customers, financials, and leadership very much align with our acquisition framework. Specifically, we expect Stratus to expand our presence in high-value specialty markets with differentiated solutions in the data center and at the edge. Lead the industry in high availability, fault-tolerant platforms, software, and services. Bolster our existing IPS technology offerings, allowing us to more comprehensively address our customer needs, increase our services capabilities and infrastructure, resulting in an additional $80 million of higher margin recurring revenue for IPS, strengthen SGH's large-scale customer base as Stratus serves a global set of customers, including more than 50% of the Fortune 100, add an estimated $150 million in annual revenue, and to be immediately accreted to non-GAAP gross margin, non-GAAP EPS, and free cash flow. Let me turn you to slide four. Over the last four years, 
SGH has had a successful track record of M&A, allowing us to diversify our revenue streams and scale our overall business. Leveraging our SGH operating system, we have effectively integrated three acquisitions which make up our Intelligent Platform Solutions Group. By strengthening our IPF leadership team, focusing on development of more differentiated technology and products, and investing in the scaling of our services organization, the IPS business has grown top-line revenues more than 30% in fiscal 2021 as compared with fiscal 2020, and has made similar gains in the first half of 22 compared to the first half of 21. The acquisition of Cree LED has been a great success as well. Our team has managed a complex manufacturing transformation, leading to gross margin expansion of close to 1,000 basis points in less than 18 months. We believe the acquisition of Stratus presents another exciting opportunity to create value for our shareholders as we continue to transform SGH. Now on to slide five. Through our growth and diversification strategy, SGH has transformed from a specialty memory products manufacturer to a developer of differentiated value-add solutions for computing, memory, and LED specialty end markets. Our revenue has nearly tripled, and the mix has changed dramatically as well. Memory Solutions was 57% of our overall sales in Q3 2022, down from 100% in fiscal 2016. And Brazil was less than 25% of overall sales this past Q3, down from 46% in 2016. Our adjusted EBITDA and free cash flow are significantly higher, and our leverage on the balance sheet is significantly less. And in fiscal 2021, Silver Lake sold its remaining stake in SDH. And we have since evolved into a fully independent public company with a board comprised of exclusively independent directors except for myself, given my role as SGH's CEO. Next slide, please. Stratus, based in Maynard, Massachusetts, was founded in 1980. The company is a longtime leader in developing high availability, fault tolerant platforms, software, and services, serving Fortune 500 enterprise customers. Stratus has nearly 500 employees in 17 locations around the globe and brings approximately $150 million in high margin revenue as part of the acquisition. It is also a recognized innovator with over 70 patents and applications that will add to the SGH IP portfolio. Please turn to slide seven. Stratus develops and markets high availability fault tolerant computing solutions for large scale enterprises in the data center and at the edge. The company has offerings specifically to address the information technology or IT edge and the operational technology, or OTS. Stratus is truly global, with nearly 60% of its revenue outside of the U.S. Their customers, which include more than 50% of the Fortune 100, operate in a diverse set of vertical markets such as financial systems, retail, oil and gas, telecommunications, transportation, and government. Turning to slide eight, the planned acquisition will both complement and strengthen IPS's current offerings and operations. IPS is focused on developing differentiated solutions for the edge, core, and cloud. Stratus offers application-specific products at the edge with their FT server and ZTC edge products. Stratus's V-series and server DC product lines complement our IPS high-performance computing platforms software, and service portfolio. As we have noted on prior calls, growing our services offerings has been a high priority for IPS. We set a record for services as a percentage of IPS revenue in our third quarter. Stratus will bolster our services scale, adding roughly $80 million in recurring revenue. In addition, we see potential for significant revenue synergies in the cross-selling of IPS and Stratus products and services to the future combined customer set. We believe the acquisition of Stratus will drive further growth and profitability as part of our IPS business. The addition of new technologies and services, 
the expanded reach to a global set of new enterprise customers, the higher gross margin model, and a leadership with a proven track record gives us the confidence that this can be another winning acquisition for the company and our shareholders. Now let me turn the call back to Ken for a transaction overview. Thanks, Mark. Let's turn to slide nine, the transaction overview slide. We expect to purchase Stratus for $225 million in cash at closing. There is the potential for an earnout of up to $50 million, which can be paid in cash or stock or any combination thereof at our option. The earnout is also subject to Stratus achieving certain gross profit targets 12 months post closing. We remain focused on maintaining a prudent balance sheet as we continue to scale and diversify SGH. We exited the third quarter with cash and equivalents of a record $387 million, and we intend to finance this transaction with cash on hand and up to $125 million from our revolving credit facility. Pro forma leverage is expected to be 2.5 times on a gross basis and up less than a quarter term compared to our gross leverage prior to this transaction. And we expect to close this transaction by the second half of calendar year 2022, subject to regulatory approvals and other customary closing conditions. Now, turning to slide 10. As Mark highlighted earlier, this transaction expands our capabilities in high-value specialty markets, in the data center and at the edge, and aligns to our growth and diversification strategy. From a financial standpoint, Stratus fits well within our acquisition framework. It adds more than $150 million of annual revenue, including more than $80 million of higher margin recurring revenue. It improves SGH's overall non-GAAP gross margins by more than 150 basis points and is expected to be immediately accretive to our non-GAAP ETF. The Stratus acquisition is a significant milestone for SGH, and its business, product, customers, and leadership further transform SGH into a growth-oriented, diversified company. On a pro forma basis, the addition of Stratus further strengthens IPS. Our IPS segment becomes a larger part of the SGH story, with revenues becoming 27% of our LTM sales, up from 21% prior to the acquisition. With that, let me open the call to questions. Operator? Certainly. If you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one on your telephone keypad. If for any reason you would like to remove that question, please press star followed by two. Again, to ask a question, press star one. As a reminder, if you are using a speakerphone, please remember to pick up your handset before asking your question. The first question is from the line of Tom O'Malley with Barclays. Please proceed. Hey, good afternoon, guys, and thanks for taking my questions. Uh, my first one is just into the August outlook. You guys have talked about a sustained amount of time here of your, your growth in August. It looks like from a year-over-year -year perspective with the guidance you're going X growth, you mentioned really strong IPS of greater than 30%, but could you just walk us through, you, you called out memory um, as, a, as a weaker segment. Can you talk about, you know, what's driving that? Is it just the consumer business in Brazil? And then you also didn't mention anything on the LED business. Could you give a little color on what that business is doing into August? Sure. Uh, Tom, thanks. This is Mark, and thanks for the question. Before I answer that, I just want to make a clarification. I think um, – Ken might have misstated, uh, we did not suspend our share repurchase program, and we are continuing to repurchase shares in the fourth quarter. I caught that but didn't want to interrupt uh, the, the presentation. Um, but, again, we did not suspend share repurchase, and we are continuing to repurchase. Now, uh, back to Tom's question. Uh, the way I look at our fourth quarter guide is that um, the biggest uh, headwind we're facing at SGH is, is through the uh, impact of uh, the consumer demand environment in Brazil tied, you know, pretty much exclusively to mobile phones and notebooks. Um, and that impact um, is, again, a headwind when, when uh, considered against the IPS uh, positive forecast. Uh, and the LED side, Tom, um, 
it's a lot less severe, but still a little bit of headwind given that about 30, 35% of the business is in our Asia Pacific region. Um, and we've got some supply chain issues as well as uh, demand side issues, uh, primarily due to the you know, COVID lockdown uh, feeding into the quarter. And so um, I think, you know, I, I look at um, the LED business maybe, you know, flat to down single digits and, um, and uh, you know, the Brazil business uh, down uh, uh, relative to the broader uh, trends I discussed, again, offset by some of the uh, strength in, uh, in uh, IPS. And, Tom, just, just to highlight there, if you look at IPS, we've been talking about it, and there is um, – some variability quarter to quarter, but we saw great growth Q3 to Q2, you know, record services, uh, which we printed, which is fantastic, the margin profile. We're going to see strong growth here into Q4, and as we look at the demand trends for that business into the first half of next year, they look fantastic. So uh, those are specific to uh, IPS and specific to SGH in terms of, of what we're seeing, and so a lot, a lot of good opportunity for us uh, in that segment. Just just another follow-up, I guess, on the memory and LED businesses. I mean, just generally, you're seeing weaker data points on consumer-facing applications. Um, can you just comment? I, I mean, I don't see, is there any reason why that would improve for both the LED and the memory solutions business into the first half of the next, next fiscal year, or do you have any commentary with that deteriorate further? Um, well, obviously, the, for the environment's a little bit tougher to predict given the volatility in the markets. Um, we think LED is, you know, relatively stable, plus or minus, uh, from where we are sit today. Um, I think that, again, depending on uh, how things play out um, in China, because uh, I guess, I, actually, Tom, just as a data point or two, the, the U.S. and European markets were actually growth segments. China was down, which offset that growth. So, um, you know, some, some positives on the LED demand. It's just the China thing was, was bigger uh, as we entered the quarter and, and again, appropriately setting uh, expectations. Um, on the, uh, the consumer business in Brazil, um, that's a hard one to call. However, I think, you know, what we're seeing is a little bit of inventory work through that reduced some of the customer demand. Um, you know, this global uh, Global uh, demand issues on mobile notebook, and I think some of our customers are working through uh, inventory that minimize their forecast for us in the quarter, which is uh, impacting our forecast. Um, I think I don't think they're working through a ton of inventory, but uh, significant enough to impact Q4. We'll watch it and try to be, you know, kind of as transparent as we can. Um, I don't uh, don't have much more than that because it just it's kind of um, uncertain to, to be able to predict. Thank you, Mr. Malley. The next question is from the line of Brian Chen with Cecil. Please proceed. Hi there. Good afternoon, and thanks for letting us ask a few questions, and congratulations on, on the acquisition. Um, yeah, maybe the first question, again, kind of a little more near term, but kind of building off, off that commentary, Mark. Um, yeah, I think there's there a lot of reports in recent weeks about, you know, one of the big handset companies uh, cutting back on some of their production to, to realign with weaker demand. It seemed like that would – the expectation was that would largely be over kind of towards the latter part of July, and so that would seem to fall well within, you know, the fiscal 4Q. And so is, is there any optimism there that – that off kind of um, the shoe tops, that business in, in Brazil maybe could, you know, rebound a little bit. Rebound is maybe not the right word, but maybe kind of um, kind of would be at a low this quarter and sort of would trend more towards a normalization um, in, in, in early next fiscal no, year. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's obviously, again, I, I want to be careful, but I would say the, the argument there that makes sense to me is that it's not like they're sitting on, our customers are sitting on, you know, months of inventory. I think what there has been has been a little bit of concern on the demand side that has built up some shorter-term uh, supply uh, inventory within their own uh, uh, system or, or, or balance sheet, so to speak. So I think, you know, um, my sense is that uh, it could get better from here. Um, 
from Q4 into Q1, Q2, but you know we're 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 just we're trying to be careful given that we don't know you know where we go from here in the broader demand of of, of the, the consumer products. Uh, but I do believe that um, the inventory isn't as severe as I've experienced in other times in the memory business. I think it's real, but it's not as significant uh, as some other cycles I've been through. So I think the argument is it could be shorter, and we just don't know enough to predict Q1 yet. It, it, no, it's fair enough. And, and just also to, to, to clarify, um, it, you fan it out to, to specialty memory, to IPS, which sounds pretty strong, and then you know, LED with the exception of supply chain in China. Sounds like you, you have seen good demand there. Any other sort of telltale indications of maybe downward changes in demand in those other markets? Doesn't sound like it, but wanted to clarify. Yeah, though, thanks for the question. No, I mean, that's the, I mean, we're kind of, it's um, interesting because it's, it's, as we're sitting here telling you a little bit about um, the LED in China and Brazil and the consumer business, um, we've got a record backlog in IPS, uh, half a billion dollar backlog and, you know, quarter over quarter growth of 30 plus percent. So it is um, it mixed demand signals, I think. By the way, I think that's kind of what's going on in the broader market. I think consumers been hit um, primarily, you know, and, and, and even in, if you look at some of the major retailers and their more recent announcements, uh, and then down into the technology sector, I think consumer tech has been hit a little bit. Um, but the enterprise space, and especially I think some of these long-term markets, these, these broader secular uh, investments that the large-scale enterprises are making in terms of AI and machine learning and what have you, I think people are going to invest through this cycle with the strong balance sheets, and we, you know, we feel our line of sight there is pretty good. So that's how we look at our business today. Great. Maybe if I can ask one question about um, sort of the Stratus acquisition, um, can you provide any more details about? I think 150 million it sounds like you bifurcated sort of what the hardware versus the software and services looks like. Um, so can you give any indication of like what the recent uh, annual growth rates have been for Stratus, sort of? you know, what the, the delta is in the margin profile for its software services versus the hardware. And anything else you want to comment on in terms of how it really meshes or synergizes well with, with you know, the Penguin Solutions maybe, business? Maybe I'll, take the sec maybe I'll take the second part first, um, and then I'll hand it over to Ken for some of the uh, financial <laughs> metrics that you asked about. Um, as many of you know, we've been uh, investors in IPS since I joined the company, and after a few years of some declining business at IPS, um, the business has had 30% growth, 21 over 20, and 30% roughly a little bit more than that in 22 first half versus 21 first half, and we are very bullish about the business. Stratus, you know, an innovator, um, strong patent portfolio, uh, and especially provider of uh, fault-tolerant, high-availability platforms, software and services has a very similar strategy in terms of the data center all the way out to the edge and building custom solutions for their end customers. And again, as I mentioned, the customer uh, base at Stratus, you know, 50% of the Fortune 100 and the customers uh, and their loyalty to Stratus have been fantastic. As we think about building out um, uh, our capabilities and our scale at IPS, the service infrastructure that Stratus brings to our ability to serve our customers and to scale into high performance compute and edge applications in their customer base is significant. Um, if you take a look at the combined service businesses of the two companies, you're well over $150, $160 million, and Ken can talk to that in a little bit. So the overall solutions mindset, service orientation, differentiation, serving enterprise customers is going to scale IPS and also allow us to expand our gross margins in the process to make this a winning transaction. Ken, maybe you can take it from here. Yeah. Uh, Brian, and just on the financial side, this is a fantastic transaction for SGH. We talked about the revenues, $150 million plus of revenues. We think we're going to do better than that. Um, on the recurring margin profile, that just adds great visibility to us as we look out over a 12, 24-month window 
uh, in terms of both the revenue and the margins. You know, if you back into the gross margin percent here, you know, this business is 45, 50% plus uh, type of gross margin, and we think it can, it can do better than that. And, and at the end of the day, it's going to produce a lot of great cash flow from a financial perspective. You know, my guess is we, we will do uh, north of a 10% cash on cash return uh, for this investment. If you looked at what we've done in the past, you look at Cree as an example, that has high teens low 20% cash on cash returns. And so our recent acquisition history has been, been good. Um, we are uh, focused on generating positive and strong cash flows and, and this should be um, similar results in terms of, of great cash on cash returns. In terms of the growth profile, just to answer your first question, when we look at this business, you have two segments. And, and one of the areas that we've talked to and spoken at even at your conference, was a focus on the edge. And that's where we can differentiate as we look out uh, over the next one, three, five years. And in that specific space, uh, if you look at the Stratus business, that part of the business has been growing in that high single-digit range. And you know, we think that can get up to that low double-digit range over time, um, which will be fantastic. But overall, you know, revenues, you know, re relatively flat with that bifurcation of strong growth uh, in the edge market. Great. Uh, thanks for all the color. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chen. The next question is from the line of Kevin Cassidy with Rosenblatt. Please proceed. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Congratulations on the acquisition. Um, just one thing, you, you didn't mention much about the supply issues that you talked a lot about last quarter. Uh, with IPS growing 30% uh, quarter over quarter, are, are the, all the issues resolved or is that still uh, limited? Um, hey, Kevin, thanks for the question. I think uh, it's, it's best to say that some of the demand that pushed out from Q3 pushed into Q4. Uh, similarly, to Q2 to Q3, and we've had this dynamic. Um, I would say there's been some mild improvement, but we're not out of the woods yet. Um, I think, uh, as you can tell from the broader backlog, um, you know, remember, this is a business that was doing roughly around $240-ish million less than two years ago. And, you know, we've got a backlog of half a billion dollars. So we're still working through that. Um, we're confident in our Q4 guidance that considers and contemplates that but um, I think the business is still constrained. Okay, great, thanks. And uh, just on Stratus, what's their engagements with their, their customers? You mentioned 50% of the top 100 or Fortune 100 companies. Uh, how long is their engagements and those services, are they, are they scheduled out for five years or three years at a time? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and we had a chance to, to uh, talk with a number of their customers in the process. Um, this is a company I've known for a long time, since my time at NCR, and their customer relations chips are, are really just best in class. They are in these large customers because they serve a very specific end need relative to mission critical applications that require this fault tolerant, uh, high availability type of uh, uh, architecture and software uh, platforms. And so um, these agreements do go out. The, I think the average customer life, uh, lifespan is somewhere around 8 to 10 years, somewhere in that neighborhood. And so, um, you know, it, 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 these applications, like for credit card processing is a good example of one, retail operations, financial institutions. The end markets we talked about uh, are very sticky and uh, really allowing us to think about how to engage further. And you might imagine that with these type of customers, that you know, the type of uh, uh, names and logos that they have in their user uh, base, you might imagine that there's a lot of uh, investment in terms of AI and machine learning that will open the doors for us to go market our high-performance compute uh, and, and, and portfolio of products and services, which is, uh, I think, is really – the revenue synergies I'm referring to, we haven't even contemplated when we talk about the transaction. So we think this is a great transaction, that light of a, of a company like Stratus who's just got such a long history of customer service and mission-critical applications. 
uh, at large enterprises, and uh, we really we're really anxious to take the next step and try to expand those relationships. Okay, sounds great. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Mr. Cassidy. The next question is from the line of Sydney Ho with Deutsche Bank. Please proceed. Uh, thanks for taking my question, and uh, congrats on the deal. Uh, it's great to see it uh, immediately accretive. Just a couple of uh, quick follow-up here. It sounds like gross margin expansion is a key consideration here. You talk about their gross margin in the 45 50% range, and you think you can do better. What's driving the expected gross margin improvement? And secondly, uh, can you walk us through how you think about this cross-selling between organic SGH and Stratus? I assume there's not much product or service overlap, but is there much customer overlap? And do you have to significantly expand your sales force to, to address that? Okay, thanks for your both the questions, and I'll try to address them in that order. Um, as far as the uh, gross margin expansion from the 45 to 50 percent uh, uh, range that Ken gave in terms of his uh, discussion of the overview of the transaction, I'd like to walk you through kind of where we came from. Um, the Cree transaction we did back in March of 21, where we closed that, um, that was a carve out in nature. Um, Stratus will be a major part of intelligent platform solutions. And so this is less of a carve out and more of a combination. And in light of that, um, we have some opportunities to take advantage of the strengths of each organization. And there's certainly strengths on both sides of the table. So this is more a combination and less of a carve out. So there's opportunities in there to be more efficient as we think about the new combined entity of IPS. Secondly, um, when you think about uh, the combined operating expense of the two businesses today, IPS as it exists in Stratus, you've got an OPEX somewhere in the neighborhood of $140, $150 million. And conservatively, we think there's probably, you know, over 12 to 18 months, there's probably 10% is how we're looking at it and modeling above and beyond A1 accretion. And that would come in the area of uh, shared services and finance, HR, IT, legal, corporate marketing, those types of things. And then as we think about, um, you know, the overlap in terms of some of the customer engagements, as well as, uh, uh, you know, our go-to uh, supply chain management and uh, PLM, uh, there's, there's opportunities there. And so when we look at our overall model going forward, we think with scale and the continued growth, remember this is a growth business, um, we see pretty good um, uh, opportunities to, to leverage that scale as this business continues to grow over the long term. And finally, I just want to repeat what I just said. Uh, you mentioned uh, Stratus has account teams serving the existing customers. Um, and obviously, uh, on the IPS side, we have our own sales organization supporting our customers. But we haven't modeled in, uh, as far as the accretion that Ken discussed, we haven't modeled, modeled in any revenue synergies, of which we think there's relatively strong uh, opportunities to convert uh, and really market uh, into Stratus' co uh, customer base on uh, high-performance compute and some of our edge portfolio. And likewise, we think there's opportunities uh, to do the same with Stratus' technologies into IPS's customer base. So uh, all in all, this deal, uh, you know, with, with the uh, scale opportunities there I mentioned and the efficiencies relative to a growing business as well as the revenue synergies, which we haven't really uh, quantified because we're trying to be hard dollar uh, in terms of our analysis, um, we think this is going to get better from here substantially. Yeah, and Brian, just, I mean, just to reiterate in terms of some of the customer opportunities, 50% well, of the Fortune 100, which Mark mentioned, three of the four largest credit card companies, uh, five of the largest 10 retailers in the world, over 11,000 systems deployed, over 4,000 customer support uh, customers. So it's really a fantastic opportunity uh, to cross-sell across IPS uh, and between Penguin Solutions and Stratus. And, and there is very uh, limited overlap uh, today, especially if you look at the product portfolio. This is really um, complementary to what we have today, and so there's some great opportunities 
that hopefully we'll, we'll be able to share with you over the next 12, 24 months. Great. That's uh, super helpful. Maybe uh, switching gears a little bit, uh, bigger picture question. Investors are generally worried about recession in the upcoming quarters. If, if there is a slowdown in global demand, which of your business do, businesses do you expect to see the impact first, and which business do you think has the most staying power? It sounds like you're quite confident with IPS business. But what are some of the key metrics that you're watching, and how quickly can you adjust your cost structure to protect your overall profit pool? Thanks. Yeah, I think this, that's a good question, and, and something that – you know, we look at on a on a weekly and daily basis. I mean, we see the markets. We we know where they're at. Um, and I would say the area that we're seeing it the most is what we we discussed earlier today. Is is really more in that consumer oriented market. Uh, that primarily for us is Brazil because uh, what we sell into uh, that market is PCs and handsets or into the PC and handset supply chain. Uh, the rest of our business, if you look at where uh, that is today. It's primarily to uh, enterprise or enterprise spending, and there are some specific growth trends that that we do have. Now, I can't call something 12 or 24 months out, but but if we look at IPS as an example, and we look out not only into the fourth quarter but into the first half of next year, we do see great demand trends for IPS, and these are specific to you know large scale. Uh, high-performance compute systems, and so that uh, will have some nice tailwinds uh, for us and specific uh, to that business line. In terms of spending, you know, I, I've been in semis for a long time. Mark's been at, at Micron and other semiconductors for a long time as well. And so, you know, if there is a cycle, obviously there are a lot of knobs that can be turned, uh, and there's you know, variable expenses that come down. There's travel expenses that come down. Uh, there are other actions that we can take and we would take and will take uh, if we see a more uh, challenging environment uh, to ensure that we generate good EBITDA and good cash flow. And I would say the one um, benefit, if you will, if things do get soft over the next 12 months would be in terms of working capital. That's been an area uh, that we've talked about where we've invested quite heavily here over the last 12 months. And uh, typically, if things get a little bit more soft, uh, we will get a positive benefit to our working capital, which adds cash and cash flow to the balance sheet. So uh, those are all things that we're going to be cognizant of, uh, and we monitor, um, and uh, we'll take the correct actions as needed, Brian. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ho. The next question is from the line of Raji. Yeah, we're going to need an account. Please proceed. Yes, thank you uh, for taking my question and introducing us uh, as well in the acquisition. Uh, we just a couple questions on the near term and, and maybe uh, one question or so on status. Um, if we're looking at the near term outlook in, in August, what's the sequential growth in IPS and LED, you know, being down kind of low single digits, it, it implies, um, you know, overall memory being down, you know, roughly 19 to 20 percent sequentially. And I just wanted to kind of break that up break that out a little bit further between Brazil and specialty memory, um, given the fact that, you know, to, to your previous commentary, you know, you're, you're trying to focus more on enterprise spending. So I, I wanted to get a sense of, are, are you seeing also sequential decline in the specialty memory, which is tied to storage and is tied to server and tied, tied to data center and networking, or is um, the majority of the decline sequentially within memory primarily related to, to Brazil? Yeah, good question. Um, I, I, from a magnitude perspective, it's certainly more uh, on the consumer-facing business in Brazil. Um, uh, I would say that uh, the other thing I would say is that, um, you know, as we ran the business in Q3, um, we had some customer shipments in Q3 uh, and in the quarter we just announced um, that we pulled into the quarter because our customers needed it, and we're you know that's we're more serviced that way in terms of our mindset of just doing the right thing. And so um, there might be a little bit of that on timing, on specialty, but in general, as you know, specialty has been a huge overperformer for us this year, and um, it's really more of an emphasis on the consumer space. Uh, there might be some timing issues, uh, Q3, Q4 revenue that, that was. Uh, 
pulled in because, again, uh, had an outstanding quarter in Q3, and, and uh, some of that uh, did come in relative to customer requirements. Uh, and so I would say that very heavily on the consumer-facing business in Brazil, um, uh, puts and takes uh, especially could be flat to maybe down, but, but I'll let Ken talk to that. But I, I would just say we haven't seen the demand signals shifting in the enterprise, especially uh, space for us. It's been, again, primarily Brazil. Yeah, so, um, Raji, on that one, it is, as Mark highlighted, it, if we see where um, that demand uh, is softening, it is uh, primarily that consumer-oriented spend, which is Brazil. It's essentially PC and, and mobile handsets in that market uh, where we're seeing um, softness into Q4. Okay, great. Thanks for that distinction. And, and just on the, the inventory, uh, the absolute dollar inventory, uh, increase. Uh, um, so if, if you look at it on a year-over-year -year basis uh, for the May quarter, it looks like uh, absolute dollar inventory increased 26% year-over-year in May, and and the revenue grew, overall revenue grew 6%. Um, so inventory growth is, is far outpacing the revenue growth. And I know that's, um, you know, in part to, for the preparation of the IPS bill, but Wanted to get a sense um, about your kind of, you talked to Ken about your working capital management, but, um, you know, any risk there in terms of an overbuild? Um, are there, is it almost all related to IPS? Is, is there some build, uh, an excess build that you had for Brazil or for, for maybe the, the portion of the specialty memory that you could see some sort of correction there? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of color there. It's a great question. If you look even Q2, uh, to our Q3, more than 100% of our inventory bill was specific to uh, IPS. So if you looked at the other two segments, uh, their inventory uh, went down quarter on quarter. Uh, but that IPS segment, we're building these large systems. We've talked about that. We're going to see 30% uh, plus growth quarter on quarter and you can't uh, order it in one week and ship it out in the next week. That's just not the, the, the business profile. And so we are um, building for not only for Q4, but that demand is there. And these are specific systems. These are custom systems for large enterprises as we look out into Q1 and Q2. Uh, and so we, we have to prepare and have a little bit of inventory in order to satisfy that demand uh, but it's something we always look at. Um, we have to. Uh, we have weekly meetings looking at the inventory, making sure we have the supply uh, to meet our customer needs, and also making sure we're not over-ordering. So there's line of sight into that spend. Yeah, the only thing I would add there is that um, given the supply environment we're in uh, and the backlog that we referenced, both Ken and I referenced, um, when you're – when you're able to get parts to take them right now, as you know from the broader semiconductor supply chain issues, and so that only further has uh, impacted our uh, positioning on inventory, uh, and again, largely IPS, which is exciting for us as that business continues to grow. And, and a quick question on IPS. Um, the services revenue, as you mentioned, was $35 million of the $95 million in, in the May quarter, um, which was, you know, almost... Uh, 37 percent of the of the IPS revenue um, even though IPS is growing in August 30 percent you mentioned it'll be more hardware new hardware installations uh, versus services do we expect then that the services related to those kind of new hardware installations and new contracts will come into play you know in, in the February May August quarter I mean what, what's the lag in terms of um, the services uh, revenue kind of being overlaid on those kind of new contracts? Yeah, that's a good question, as we've talked about. I think you're, you're pointing out to the nature of the, of the business, especially as we're growing, right? Because, um, you yeah. know, it's, it's quite possible that, you know, as we talk about the growth in top-line revenue, um, the mix uh, as a percentage will change. But I think to answer your question more specifically around when the service base increases from, these new installations, it's normally like a one to two quarter lag in terms of uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the service contracts and agreements because a lot of what we do up front is on design, engineering, and what have you, and, and manufacturing the systems, testing the systems, and then uh, the service element is then 
kind of kicks into a, a higher portion of the transaction uh, mix, if you will. Got it. And, and, and just and like to way, one question. I, I want to emphasize. That. Sorry, just right because because you brought kind of you brought a, another thought as I thought about the question you asked. Is we we are in a business where there are some some of our competitors and some of our customers who are kind of more hardware hardware mindset. And I've said all along, and, and Thierry's teams executed really well in this way. You know, we're not looking for hardware only transactions. That's not how we're going to grow. And you know, we're outgrowing the industry today and focused on delivering high value services. And that's kind of, you know, what sets us apart, I think, from our, comp our competitors in the business. And so, you know, as we scale and as we grow our capabilities and services, I think you're gonna only see that become more important as a profile of this business. Yeah, that's super helpful to understand that. And, and, and just quick question on Stratus. Um, it, based on your commentary, so it appears like the, the, the main differentiation uh, and value add for, for this, what this company brings is, I guess, deploying um, mission critical applications um, for you know a lot of these customers you you, you talked about. Um, just wondering, uh, how long has this company been around? Um, sure. can I, and what's kind of the competitive landscape uh, uh, in, in that market for mission deployment of mission critical applications for the data center for the edge? So Stratus has been around since 1980, and uh, at the risk of uh, dating myself, I used to compete against Stratus when I was at NCR because it was uh, uh, Tandem, Stratus, Unisys, and NCR to an extent had fault-tolerant architectures in the data center mainframe part of the market, and this is for, again, these uh, Fortune Enterprise applications for mission-critical uh, needs, and, uh, you know, 100% targeted uptime, 99.99. 9999. And so they have a 40 year history of serving the world's largest companies in mission critical applications. And when you think about the next gener generation of mission critical applications, we're on the, we're on the cutting end of, end of that with Penguin Solutions. And so the combination of customer relationships, existing service relationships, hardware installations, platforms, it is just a fantastic combination of a company that's been doing this for nearly four decades with the innovation that a company like Penguin Solution offers. And I think that is just a, a great marriage of what we can go to at large scale customers uh, as we grow and expand the business from here. That's great. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gill. There are no additional questions waiting at this time, so I will turn the call back over to Mark Adams, the CEO, for closing remarks. Thank you, Operator. At SGH, we are focused on building long-term value for our shareholders. We are well-positioned and attractive end markets such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, data analytics, high-performance computing, and cloud solutions, each with compelling long-term growth potential. I am confident that we can continue to invest in our business while operating the company to maximize shareholder value. We operate with a capital light model and are able to generate positive cash flows more effectively throughout market cycles when compared to more capital intensive businesses. We will be disciplined in our approach to ensure strong, continued strong financial performance and cash flow generation while investing for our long-term success. In short, I continue to be very excited about our future at SGH. We appreciate all of you for joining today's call. That concludes the SGH third quarter fiscal 2022 earnings call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect your lines.